All right. Welcome, everybody, to the weekly Probate Mastery Group coaching call. I'm in my West Coast office today. I finally made it on the Ho River. We talked about dry camping last week, so I figured I would uh, just go with that theme, keep it alive. So I'm out here literally in the extreme northwest country in the middle of nowhere, and my internet setup has been doing well this week. So the, the camping thing was a joke, but we did actually have a, an interesting conversation last week about how you can maximize returns on, on properties you're holding. And my friend who I referenced last week, I've talked to her. She's going to join us for like an Ask the Expert series to really unpack how she is using that strategy to pay land off in three to four months. And she unfortunately was pretty sick last week and, and we haven't been able to do it. But we do have the expert in the space that, that's kind of teaching it to her audience. And uh, I'm going to have Cody come and, and talk about that with us so you guys can ask her questions. So in probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll hopefully get her and learn what she's doing. Pick up pieces of land in places like this for a little bit of nothing and have them paid off in three or four months and make a 30% rate of return. Um, so that's coming. And... A lot of familiar faces. Gary, welcome back. Anything, anybody have anything, any wins they want to share? Anything you're struggling with? What can we do to serve you today? Hey, uh, um, Chad. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to raise my hand. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, you, well, you, you opened up the, uh, you said if anybody had any questions. So based on what we talked about last week, you mentioned that uh, the appointment setting with the VA. I had a question. So considering that to a large degree, a lot of what we're doing is referring the rep. You know, we're referring the rep to you know different services and different you know people that are in our social net, not social network, but in our within our network. Do you feel that it's okay to say you know that we have free services that we offer? Considering that you know a lot of what we do is just referring them to people, and a lot of those people that we refer them to we give them free consultations. Or do you think that I'd be skating on a thin line? Okay, okay, good. So it's okay. No, like if it's a registered investment advisor, you know, like my pitch would be, you know, listen, a lot of folks don't know what to do. Life insurance isn't going to be part of the probate for Mr. PR. But a lot of folks aren't sure what they can and cannot do and what the options are to invest a lump sum life insurance payment. So what I'd like to do is offer you an hour to sit down with them. We only work with registered investment advisors. And what that means is this person has a much higher level of ed education but also a few fiduciary responsibility for every client. So we have vetted these financial services professionals and we only work with the best. Can I offer you an hour of his time just to get your questions answered? And you kind of create that perception that you're paying for it <laughs> just to, to add value to, to, you know, to the fact that you have vetted this person and found the right one. But I'll present them like that in the same way with your attorneys, like with your estate planning attorneys. Can I give you an hour of hours because you're giving them a referral, right? So treat it like it's on your team at your cost just to continue to kind of build that perceived value of your service and the relationship. Awesome. Thank you. you have been here and you've been very quiet. I want to know. <laughs> about to ask you a question, but you beat me to the punch. Everything's going well. I got that San Diego property in escrow, contingent free, significantly over ask. So they're happy. Um, now putting them in touch with a uh, financial advisor so that they don't they don't just blow through all that money. My question that that was the win. The question is. I'm starting to get busier, so I'm obviously grateful for that, and I'm happy that that's taking place. Um, finding that it's as if I'm doing a lot of tedious tasks that are taking away from me doing dollar productive activities. And I'm at the point where I'm just questioning when is the time to start delegating and when is it too soon to start delegating? And I, oh, you, I don't know so, that you were here. I, I mentioned you when I brought this up the, the week after we had your time management when you held yourself accountable in front of the world about time management. Mm -hmm. The following week, I don't know if you listened to that call, but we talked about Tony Robbins' RPM and urgency importance. Okay. Have you have you listened to that? Like we, you, I, I used you as the example. I have not. I'll look up. Maybe I'll ask Kat which week that was so I can make sure to listen to that report. Yeah, I think I was on a riverbank on the other side of the country. But so the Tony Robbins has a course called it's been called RPM time of your life. It's basically it's RPM his rapid planning method. But a lot of it is about time management. So having a big picture plan on your daily plan, but based on basically two two key variables, urgency and importance. 
as entrepreneurs, we and especially as real estate entrepreneurs, we tend to focus and spend 90% of our time on things that are urgent, but not important. Now, mm-hmm. it, you yeah. can say, well, it's, it's important. You've got to chase this paperwork. We've got to have this addendum yeah. signed. Mm-hmm. But is it so important that we have to do it? Like, can't somebody else do that? Yeah. And Tony's personal goal is to spend at least 60% of his time on things that are not urgent, but are very important, like mm-hmm. this. Like being yeah. out, living, being in a place that, that feeds your soul, spending time yeah. with people that you love. So any time that you're spending, you know, more than 40% of your time on those things that aren't family, friends, hobby, you're a bit out of alignment. Like if you want to. Yeah. Live. Yeah. So there's a matrix that we shared within the show notes of that call. I wish I had it right now. Cat, if you can find that, drop it for fed. Because I sat with it for a couple of weeks after you and I had that conversation. I'm like, I mean, I could teach a course just on this. And it, it's something that fortunately I was able to finally get right. And that's why I can spend a lot of my time doing the non-urgent, but very important. So but look at that. If I know that one of your challenges is you choked yourself with information. So I'm very hesitant to recommend you take the whole RPM course. But at mm-hmm. least digest that matrix, like look at it. it he yeah. does it in a, the graphic is like a target and, and the mm-hmm. bullseye. The bullseye is spending at least 60% of your time doing just things you love. We usually can't start there unless we were got a massive life insurance recipient or something. But the time to start delegating is now. The things to start delegating first are the things that are urgent, but not important. So one of the best things any of us can ever delegate is transaction coordination. So from, from contract to close, I think it's one of the most critical parts of the deal. It's where most people let off the gas. But if you want referrals and you want to build a, a great, one of the best things you can do is provide a, a level of service that far exceeds even the title company's expectations. The lenders will love you. You know, the title company will love you. Gary Nash, you're going to have to quit that, dude. But uh, so the first things to delegate are those things that are important uh, or that are, that are important, but not important enough that, that you need to be doing them. So when it comes down to but the guy, the mentor that kind of my first real good said, if you're doing more than four deals a month, and this was in row where my meeting was going, but as long as you have consistent revenue. So if you're on that cash flow roller coaster and you still have months where you're starving to death, then it's, you might, you know, hire somebody you love and she loves, he or she loves working for you and you can't pay them. And that's a really embarrassing moment. But if you feel like the cash flow in the business has been stable over the last, let's just say six months, if you had stable cash flow to support somebody at that, that whatever that income level is in your area, probably, and it's probably time to bring on your admin. And that person is to help with transaction coordination, the day-to-day office. If you're lucky enough to get one, a showing is for you to meet with someone. Anything that is talking to a client, if it's not free contract client conversations, then that's their job. And then that frees up all of your time, free contract, whether that's on the list side or the buy side. Or that's what I would recommend is have four months of consistent finances that will support the salary at that level. Go hire yourself best bad men you can get. They'll free up at least 20 hours of your time, probably 40. And that was that was a huge inflection point for me when I finally had the courage to do that. I went from, you know, eight deals to 15 or 16 deals a month time to do the things that were most important. Things that were not urgent, but very important. And those can be things like outbound prospecting, adding another attorney to your referral network. If you don't do it, it's not going to be the end of the world. It could feed you for the next Twenty years of your career that I was fading in and out. I apologize. I... You there? Oh, there you are. You're back. Yeah. Uh, so okay. So that no received and understood. I'll definitely look into that right now. Look into finances. Fin- I mean, cost of living here is really high. So although I've been consistent as far as having funds come in, I'm also just planning. You know, just making sure that I'm also covered for the next twelve months as far as living expenses uh, prior to making any type of commitment of hiring someone. So let's talk about, taking, let's talk about yeah. business lines of credit. It's something we haven't really talked much about here, but if you bank with a, a community bank or a regional bank, one of the things I do when I get hey. a bank account and I'll something, you know, I oh, shoot, let me see if I can kill video and make it through this. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Fed? Loud and clear. So one of the things that I do when I start a new company, I'll take, you know, 10 or 20,000 bucks, go open a business okay. bank account with a community bank or a regional bank, try to stay, say, you know, under a $10 billion bank. 
And then I, I open a business bank account. Then I ask them for a line of credit. And I use, I don't know if they're in California. I use First Citizens Bank for this. I can take a brand new LLC with a brand new EIN number and walk out with a $49,900 line of credit. As long as I ask for less than 50000 it doesn't even have to go to underwrite it. It, oh, wow. it could be something that would help create a, a, a safety zone for you. So if you can set up a business line of, on your realtor bank account, then you know if I have a bad month, you know, and you obviously that's an emergency fund, then you could comfortably hire. And the person, if you make the right hire, that person can understand, listen, I have to bring, and my goal for, for any employee, you should demand a three-to-one return. So if you pay that person fifty grand, you should gain one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in productivity back in revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they should be fully aware of that, right? You should be transparent about the business finances and like, listen, I'm having to dip into lines of credit to make payroll this month. You and I need to work together hand in hand to get back on track and get us off the cash flow roller coaster. And they should be eager to jump in. So don't ever spend money if you don't if you don't think you have a way to pay it back. It could create a comfort you know, if you had a fifty thousand dollar line of credit. It's not gonna be very often you dip into that, but it's there. And you're basically play it paying prime plus prime plus one or prime No, that helps a lot actually. I had, I had no idea about that. But that actually's I'm going to look into that right away because I just think to your point, you you make a good hire like that and then all of a sudden you're multiplying your business. I have skills in some areas and other people have are significantly more skilled than others. And so why should I bang my head at trying to do those other things when they can do it way better than me and run circles around me? And it doesn't matter because that's not what I do. I do other things. And so if that can grow everyone that I'm fully on board with that. Um, Let me ask you this, Fed. If, if I gave yeah. you 20. I can't hear you. If you gave what? 20 what? If I gave you 20 hours of time in your business this week, what would you do with it? If you gave me 20, 20, 20 available hours, I would do what I've been wanting to do, which I located in the last couple of months properties that are distressed that I want to, you know, run data on and submit to developer clients of mine. I would actually make, you know, figure out a way to get all the letters ready for these people, reach out to these people and make something happen out of it. Cause I know there's, there's business there. And I just find myself every night just saying, oh my God, I did so much BS tedious work that again, I'm putting this off to tomorrow because I have a deadline with the other items. Even the, the San Diego deal, fortunately it's an escrow and it's contingent free, but it took a lot of time out of my schedule. I tried to refer it out to San Diego, to a San Diego agent client said no. So, you know, it was taking me three hours and 15 minutes just to get there. And then maybe about an hour and 40 minutes to get back. So at least one of the two ways, either the way there or the way back was taking me roughly three, three and a half hours. So that's a lot of time. It's basically a whole day. A lot of times just to even get a signature or something like that. Now that we're in escrow, escrow is helping me out a lot. They, you know, they have one of their officers who lives in San Diego. So they just bring the paperwork, explain it. We get on you know, a FaceTime if the grandson or granddaughter are available. Otherwise the seller's 96 years old. So it's a little, little challenging, but fortunately we're going to close that in the next uh, 20 days. All contingencies are out. EMD has been released. Well, to I want to come seller. back to that deal fed. So of yeah. that 20 hours, I, I switched yeah. networks. So I think, I think I should be oh, clear now. Gotcha. I don't know if you're up. Uh, I, I heard everything. But in that 20 hours of activity, like when you're doing yeah. those things you said you would do, how much do you think you could get one deal if you did that for 20 hours? Yeah, for sure. So, and that for one sure. deal on, on that side of the business, that deal would be what, 30 to 50,000 bucks in revenue off of an investor yeah. deal? If, if, if not more, realistically, the, the ones that I've been eyeing, so the, the properties that I've located and I created a file with address, everything you know, just, to, and I know what, what the exit price would be. It would probably be an acquisition cost of anywhere between 1.8 to 2.9, maybe 3.2 million with an exit of, if you bought at 1.8, you'd probably be at 5.5. Five. If you bought at 3 million, you'd probably be out at, I don't know, anywhere from high eights to double digits. So what's your I mean, revenue on the deal? I mean, it's let's hypothetically call it 25 K per million on, on gross, gross, re gross revenue. Say it's $25,000 a month. If we give you an extra, eight, yeah. you've already, you've already hired 
a, a rock star admin. Yeah. And that line of credit can give you the buffer. We'll call it the buffer of courage to actually, you know, pursue that. So you've got revenue now to make a payroll. You can go find this person as long as you do a good job of training them and they're clear on what their role is that you've documented the processes in your business. And I would point okay. you, if you don't, if you don't feel like you're ready for that, I would point you to the e revisited. So look at every little piece of your company and okay. document those processes. And I mean, checklist, okay. written video training. So when you bring this person on, they can wrap their head around everything you brought into this business over the last X number of years. They can quickly digest that and see where they plug in. And then, you know, in week two or week three, then you're out there doing those 20 hours of, of prospecting, of investor prospecting. And in month two or month three, you're hitting those consistent $25,000, $30,000 deals while she, he or she does your admin work that's, that's eating you up. Because so, also, I think a, a huge, huge weakness that I have in my business is... I don't have a CRM. I mean, I, I think that's probably the worst thing for me to say. I really don't have one and I can't get myself to do it. I just find it so time consuming, even though, I mean, it's, I, it's tedious and time consuming. At the same time, okay. I feel that if that were organized, it would create so much more clarity on the path of the journey. So it's this I, simple. You're losing, you are losing money because of what you yeah. just said. And I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to let David, I'm going to, I'm going to sick David on you here. He, he built his own version. <laughs> I, I think he said that just to get me excited. <laughs> He's all yours, Dave. Go get it. You're an idiot, man. You're just talking out your ass right now. Yeah, you need no, to get, you need to get a CRM. Yeah, no, I know. And, I man, that is, oh, I'm actually yeah. looking at mine right now. I'm just like. <laughs> I got 35 tasks to do. I got 79 emails. I got so Dave, like back up a little bit in time before you finally called yourself an idiot and hired ERN yeah. and, and made that investment in your business, show some vulnerability here and tell him how damn dumb you were and, and what that timeline looked like and how, what, what helped you make that decision? Yeah. That, well, shoot. When I got in the business, we didn't have the, the CRMs we have now that I'm very appreciative to have. So now everybody offers them. So well, which one do you pick? There's, and you know, it, I was with real estate webmasters forever since 2007. It's just a real estate web company, but they're in so demand there. Everyone kept asking, when are you going to build a database? When are you going to build a database? And it, just, it took them until probably 2012, 13 to actually organize a nice CRM. And then, you know, all the other companies started coming out. Haas Pratt had his own. Nowadays, every company, there's thousands of them, but I don't, the CRM is just your database. It's uh, when I think about putting somebody, I've already added two people this morning that probably will never sell the house, but we had really good conversations and they asked me to send a business card to them. So I put them a task there to call them in six months from now. You know, it, I would not remember to call that person back in six months from now and ask yeah. them for a referral. I've gotten so much business from just, that's the Kevin Ward thing that, that he teaches A, B, or C. You put them on your A, B, or C list to call back in the party. Yeah, and it's like a bucket. Yeah, it's like, yeah. So, yeah, it. I pay for my CRM. It's the core of my business. I pay close to 1500 a month for it. Mm -hmm. it, it. It is an admin person. It is an employee. But I guarantee yeah. you, I make a million dollars from it. No, I hear you. I guess where I'm overwhelmed, and it doesn't mean that I'm not willing to do it. I just need to figure out how to get myself to do it. I guess the overwhelming part Well, you call is, Sierra Interactive and you say, I want uh -huh. the basic CRM and yeah. you give me your credit card numbers. No, I get it. Yeah. I, I, then, I, I would then need to input the contacts that realistically, I don't have everyone's contact. Yeah, so you, that's not yeah. an excuse. I'm just trying to figure out. Where are your contacts now? I guess now? the overwhelming. Your, yeah, I, mean, for, I have their phone numbers, but it's more like I would need, in my opinion, but correct me if I'm wrong. I would almost maybe need to hire someone to take all those contacts and maybe create, whether it's an Excel sheet or go into the CRM that you're referring to and actually fill those gaps out. I guess that's where I'm just seeing I'm to do that. Yeah. Thanksgiving phone number. Yeah. And then you ask them, I okay. want to send you a Thanksgiving card. You get an address or an email from them, okay. or you put a task yeah, in there to, or you put a task in there to, for 20 of them this month, 20 next month to ask for an email address. And that's fair. just the okay. task that you knock out. Yeah. No, that's I totally mean, it, I, yeah, I get it, man. And 
and it sucks to move the CRM once you have mm. one. So it's so critical to to have something that you're gonna work on. Yeah, but uh, I see the importance. So of, yeah, go ahead. I want to give you some action steps here because this is a yes, big sir. thing. Like yeah, this yeah. can get over you. overwhelming really quick. I hear the you. first thing you need to do, like, what is yeah. your budget? Do you, do you have $150 a month to spend or do you have 1500 or somewhere in the middle? Like, what are you comfortable with? Yeah, okay, okay. Once you've determined, you don't have to answer now. It's stuff to think about. But then what okay. features must you have? Obviously, okay. any CRM is going to hold name, phone number. But is it customizable? Like, can you create your own custom rating? Like David says ABC. Someone else will say okay. hot, warm, cold. Someone yeah. else would say pro prospect, client, past client. Yeah. But okay. you want to be able to use you want to be able to use tags. You want to be able to right. you know right. filter people down. So if you have okay. somebody that their you know contact type is investor, then okay. you want to have like a, a subtype where it, it's you know uh, long term buy and hold, landlord, fix and flip. Like so you can break it down because your list okay. as your list grows, it becomes more overwhelming. So just make sure that it has all the features you want. There are a million CRM companies out there. A lot okay. of them are designed. It's, it's just a blue box for realtors and in the investment side of your business, it's not going to stand up. That's how people like David end up going with a custom build with a company mm -hmm. like Sierra Interact. Gary Nash was is, has written on the board there, Salesforce. And okay. Salesforce is an extremely robust CRM. It has quite a bit of a learning curve, but this, we can't answer these questions for you. You can go with yeah, Podio for go with Podio for free. Go to Upwork okay. and hire a Podio expert to completely customize it, or okay. you can go plug into Sierra Interactive and say, "Give me the David Pinnell packet." Okay. Salesforce is, is great. It's, you're going to the good thing about the bigger platforms like Salesforce, the Podio, anything that's got a high adoption rate. You can typically find contractors that'll work for thirty to fifty dollars an hour to do the build out work. Okay. Then train your admin, and then your admin can clean up your contacts. She can take your phone list, your spread your spreadsheets, wherever your old contracts, your email account, wherever she can gather this information. Okay. And do the imports. There's it's it's tough. Like you know, Gary's a Salesforce guy. I'm a HubSpot guy. David's a Sierra Interactive guy. There's no right answer. You've got to look mm -hmm. at the feature set and what's okay. absolutely necessary. Yeah. I would say that having worked on at least a half a dozen and built from the ground up a half a dozen CRMs, what a, pick one that you can grow into. Don't put, like, cause what, like David said, it's extremely painful to make this move. So if you get a really basic CRM that doesn't mm -hmm. fit your need, you can't customize and add, you know, add certain variables to it. Yeah. Then six months or a year from now, you're going to be, man, how do I, and a lot of CRM companies will make it difficult to handle the export and the import. And it, it's a painful move. So yeah. Pick one that you feel like you can afford, one that you feel like you can grow into, not that you'll grow out of. And also look on Upwork and look around at other places to see okay. when I'm stuck. And you're going to get stuck, even if it's just, I don't freaking feel like doing this anymore. I'm capable, but I don't want to do it. Like, can you find a contractor to do that work for you if you're stuck? And okay. that's the right, that's the right platform, the right combination of cost features and, you know, available help when you need it. And okay. then just, just to that. clarify, I haven't done any customizations. It's not the David L. David's package on Sierra. They have 40 something programmers just because it's yeah. a cloud-based. It's, I pay $400 for just the CRM and website, I believe. But they, it's it's forty programmers that they're always adding stuff to and upgrading it. And it, to me, you know, it's it just organizes. It. I look at it. The first thing I look at when I log in, what do I need to do today? And I can share my screen if you want. I have like I have twenty five prime people ready to pop. Yeah, Sierra Interactive. They're actually they were with Real Estate Webmasters and got so frustrated with them that four of the uh, realtors went and built their own company with a programmer oh, wow. now it's blossomed into 400 employees in Louisville, kentucky and i think they're just they're doing everything they can to help realtors but for the investor side it doesn't really do much for us but i still put the context in there and just put a tag there for cash opportunities wholesales flippers whole you know whatever it is because i could i could run a quick excel tag i could run my tags and get everybody i need to call you guys like kind of you guys hovered 
on the the main items that one should look for and then also just kind of gave examples because it, it made it a lot more clear for me to get a better understanding of how you guys were peeling that onion i'd rather see you i started to call you an idiot earlier i mean yeah probably <laughs> i'm just and everybody else i apologize for my language my, my goal is to add two people it. to my crm a day so it's not like I need to import yeah, yeah, six thousand people and then figure out how to uh, categorize. Yeah. If you could add two people, ten people a week, it's very minimum. That's like minimum. Yeah. But the idea is someday you're going to give this to somebody else to run. Yeah. You're going to give it to an admin. You're going to give it to a buyer's agent. You're going to give it to a listing agent. You're going to give it to a acquisition agent. So in six months, I don't know where I'm going to be. I'm going to have two acquisition agents. So I need to tag everything so that I say, look, you got these tasks to do. No, that um, makes so, so much some sense. Folks, some folks ask what I use. When I was in production as a realtor, what I found at, at the time without building out something like Infusionsoft or HubSpot, I actually used Top Producer. And oh. the reason I chose it, the predominant reason I chose it, Fed, was it has a really good transaction management side to it. Oh, so yeah. not only did it not only did it act as a CRM, it was I built all of my personal checklist. I encouraged you earlier to get everything in your business down to a system and a checklist. Like this is how we do a buyer contract. This is how we do an acquisition contract. This is how we do a listing agreement. Every one of those had a I had a checklist for pros, the, from prospect uh, well, from lead to prospect was a checklist. From prospect to contract was a checklist. From contract to close was a checklist. And I just simply turned those into workflows. So the CRM would tell me or my assistant or my agents at any given time what where we were in the life cycle of that deal. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of other CRM companies have caught up and have an even better UI. Salesforce, an example, you can buy plugins that are already where all this work is done. The one thing I would say, the biggest mistake I've made with CRMs is I built them myself. And I probably have one to 300 hours in CRMs that I've built. I've built on Microsoft Dynamics. I've built on Zoho. I've built on Cold Fusion. And I've built on Top Producer. So those four, and now HubSpot. So I've built my own from the ground up. And that's with <clears throat> pretty proficient that I taught myself on Microsoft Dynamics first. But even though I have the skill set, it's still one of the stupidest things I've ever done. So when I set out to build HubSpot for this company, like to switch from the cold fusion, I actually was smart enough to hire help and get it done. But it's not inexpensive. Like it takes some money to get a big robust CRM up and running. It, it's having it be customizable is really good, but you have to you have to balance, right? Like it's it's you can really you can really spend an exorbitant amount of time getting these things built. So the $1,500 a month can sound insanely expensive until you look at the amount of time or delegation required to get a CRM to that point of functionality. Like for example, Salesforce and Gary, I'm going to kick it to you here in a second. Now, Salesforce has basically pretty smart. They can help you prospect by texting and emailing your people with a moving toward AI. They've invested heavily in them. I don't know if Sierra Interactive has that. I think you have SMS integrated here. We have everything that they offer now, and it's yeah. and most of the costs are running ads and stuff to the CRM. But so I just include that all. I shouldn't include it, but it should be marketing. But it's Sierra has all that now with the help of some outside coaching help. And Gary is. Tell us how you're using uh, Gary as a home buster franchise. He's a big landlord. I'm just. Are you, you have a microphone, Gary? Tell us what you love about Salesforce. How if you hired work to be done, what your cost is. Uh, we still don't have your audio. I only know why you're writing on the board. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We can. Okay. Good. Yeah. Fortunately, with the Homebuster franchise, Salesforce comes with the package, and so really the way that I use it is I, I farm it out to a virtual assistant. And all I do is just plug the data in. I gave her the perimeters and then she actually kind of managed it. And then I would just get emails. That's really the easiest way. But the thing I like or love about Salesforce is that you can put all your variables in there and it's real easy to track all of your leads. And like David said, you're not going to remember to call somebody in six months and you, you need that to help you or remind you of what's going on and where you last, you know, left off. And so I mentioned Salesforce I've used when I had my construction company, 
There was a, another kind of a lead source that was designed for, for contractors. And we were able to, you know, kind of plug that information there. And even before that, I think it was ACT, I think used to be one that we were using, but I've never been without a CRM. It's really important. And so th that's really, you know, kind of all I have to say about that, Chad. Okay. What I'd like you to do is first figure out what your budget is for this project. What's a comfortable monthly? And then you'll know that'll help you shorten the list. Then go look at the ones in that price category. We've talked about HubSpot. We've talked about Salesforce. We've talked about Sierra Interactive. We've talked about Podio uh, on the lower, the lower end of the scale. That's more of the DIY, like unless you can find the plugins. But figure out what your budget is. Then choose your platform. Then decide whether you are going to start doing the contact aggregation, cleaning up your list and getting it ready for the import or whether that's something you can afford to sub out to a contractor or whether you choose a company who might offer that as part of a service for being a subscriber to their platform. And then put a date to this. Like, and, and I'll ask you right now in front of everybody, when is your CRM, all your imports are done and you've got, you're using it with discipline. Like it's part of your daily, the first thing you do in the morning is look at your CRM. What's that date? What's today? The third? 15th. Yeah. Appreciate okay. That. Okay, how about You're September not, 15th? How about in one month from now? 30 days. Does that sound fair? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm writing that. that down. I'm literally writing that down right now. Okay. There's, I mean, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of options out there, but we've talked about, I mean, you've seen what, what we kind of use at the higher level. Some of the folks, I think it was Balcom that said he's using Podio, but he hasn't been very good at it. So if you don't mind, jump in and share your experience with Fed, with Podio. I, I did build on it. That's when I forgot. I, I didn't use it a whole lot, but... Anyone who's using Podio regularly, jump in and let them know what your experience has been. Sure, I can let them know. Yeah, I think I said that last week that, that it was I was a bit behind, I think it was, during the last call. But in all fairness to Fed, I've got a programming background, so I don't think that I'm technically the, uh, the common usage case. But honestly, <laughs> to pair it, what Chad's already said, I've already found like three or four other developers where... You know, all they do is Podio development and pretty much everything that, that Chad said, that Gary said, that David has said, they, they know all this stuff. They know everything that you need. You know, this is literally, this is all they do. They just develop Podio for investors and for agents. And, you know, you can Malcolm, find- where are you, are you finding your developers on Upwork or where do you, where do you find your help? Oh, I, I listen, 100% Upwork, 100%. I find everybody on Upwork and you can get them for, you know, I don't want to say cheap because cheap has a low perceived value. So I'll say at, you know, very budget friendly, affordably, like the, the lowest one that I found he, for the entire package, and I'm talking about like full pipeline from your prospecting all the way till, you know, the transaction coordinators got their hands on it. The lowest one I found was 250. And like, he, he gave me a tour. He showed me, you know, the entire walkthrough and you don't have to do anything. In fact, not only does he build it out for you, if you have a spreadsheet of raw data, He'll even have someone on his team put the data in for you. So I've had, so far, I've had great experiences with Podio. Definitely plan to move up to Salesforce one. I've grown out of Podio, but I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Well, thanks. Thanks for your input. So yeah, Fed, I love that you're willing to put an aggressive date to it. You've got a big project. Phase. I would say that's one of those critical steps before you they have a central place to work around each day, right? Like that's where Deal. You, yeah. you track the deals that are in. The deals that are in escrow need to be in there. And I mean, this is on the contract. The details need to be put in and that needs to be tracked throughout the system. And what you'll find is your level of customer service is going to go through the roof and it, it helps your relationship with your clients, with your vendors, everyone around you be thankful that you right. No, that, that makes total sense. And I, and I agree because especially fortunately lately, the, the level of clientele from a wealth point of view has been going up. And therefore I noticed that obviously they they have this expectation of we want everything and more. So obviously, uh, to your point, yeah, I agree. I think that this is definitely the first step prior to, otherwise the next move won't work. It's almost like building a house without a foundation. So without the foundation, it's not going to stay up. So I completely agree. I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I want to make one suggestion that I forgot earlier on yeah. when you're ready, when you're ready to find that ad, and this is really big far outpace what the normal real estate ad. If you can find somebody who works in a, in a title company or an escrow company's office that is not happy in their work 
and for example, they have to come to the office every day, but they want to work virtually. A lot of times you can pay them the same money they're making and just give them more of the lifestyle that they can't achieve in their current role because they have to be in the office running back and forth to the courthouse all day. You can poach people from title companies and from banks. Uh, bank employee, bank tellers can be grossly underemployed. Like they can be, have college degrees and MBAs and be really strong operational people, but they just took the, they took the safe route, took a job at a bank branch. Mm-hmm. So be thinking about that too. Like who do you know at title companies or at that local bank that you could maybe take out to lunch and have a conversation? That's one of the pointers I forgot to give you. That's good. No, that's really smart, actually. I appreciate that. I'm going to do that yeah. for sure. If you see a title girl that's about to have a baby, take yeah. her to lunch and put her on okay. your team because she's going to – but she'll still have that skill set and she still needs to make money, right? So give her the lifestyle freedom that, that she wants to get and pay her the same money. I mean, that's an operational skill set. Yeah, no, for sure. That's actually a super good point. It's completely different – topic but still on the the time management or i guess important versus urgent so i've been doing a lot more door knocking there is this neighborhood that i've been going after for quite some time now and i decided to be a lot more pro, you know proactive and just in front of people and i decided with this associate that i'm doing it with that we're going to quote unquote touch the neighborhood by door knocking once a month, by sending them a mailer, whether that's a postcard or some type of new newsletter once a month. So, so they're going to see us in person. Secondly, they're going to receive something in the mail. And third, we're also going to uh, reach out to them via internet. Okay. So I'm noticing though, that given that the neighborhood at 600 homes, often my associate and I takes us about we calculated it's about an hour for every hundred homes. So if there's, to me, actually call it two hours for every hundred homes. So then you got 600 homes total. It takes a lot of time between driving to the neighborhood and then doing it. What would you say the level of importance is of she and I doing the actual door knocking versus, for example, hiring help to do that? Or is the, is it, how, is it extra important for us to be there so that we're the face behind the information that's being provided opposed to getting it done faster? Does that make sense? Money. We just finished the other day. It's 600 every time we go. Okay. And if you knock 600 doors, how many good conversations? Six. I, I mean, strangely, this neighborhood, everyone's su- super friendly, but yeah, maybe uh, not that many. Yeah, that's true. I think what, what David said, probably, yeah. If it's 10 out of every 600, we're being generous, put it that way. Then it's probably not that important that you're the one doing it. Yeah. And you may even consider switching to more of a farming campaign where you use EDDM, every door direct. Mm-hmm. And you just, for pennies, you put you put yeah. an eight, eight and a half by 11 in there. It could replace that. If you yeah. said, I knocked 600 doors and I took six listings, I would tell your ass to be out there every month. Like, you, you go do it. But if you're not, like, if... if Typically, those campaigns are, it's a nine to 12 month cash conversion cycle. It's mm-hmm. about repetition, right? So if you can delegate that to a person, I don't know if anyone here has ever delegated door knocking, let me know. I don't, I'm not aware of anyone delegating it, but it may make more sense for you to just farm your farm that area using things like EDDM and get the touches in, get the repetitions in. But the, the most valuable thing you have is your person time it's yeah. like we said earlier if you had 20 hours if, if you weren't door, door knocking for 20 hours what would you be doing so you may think about delegating it to the mailman yeah fair enough yeah Jeff, that's why because we're obviously we're looking to be creative obviously not reinvent the wheel but just also not be like every other realtor that's oh i'm dropping off a market report blah blah, blah. we did a right. thing over the holidays where where we told the entire neighborhood. So we door knocked the entire neighborhood and told them, hey, look, since winter's coming to an end, we're picking up close for the less fortunate. Anything that you may not have, we're coming on this day between this time. And we got really good response. People were saying, oh my God, this is amazing. Blah, blah. And we got a ton of clothes for people. And then we followed up the following month with thank you so much for your donation. It was given to this, to this company and we sent them a picture. 
And then a few months later, there was uh, Valentine's Day. So we did a, whatever, a cute little pouch or three Hershey's kisses in each one. And then a little card that says, happy Valentine's to you and your loved ones from your trusted real estate specialist, Federico and Andrea. And every time we knocked at the door, the irony was that it was often men who said, oh my God, thank you. This actually looks really cute. You just saved me. Now I'm not going to get in trouble with my wife. I'm going to just take your card out and give it to my wife or to my mother to whatever. But it worked out really well. But at least we did that so that next time I see you, you connect me saving you with your mother, your wife, your whatever, your significant other. And you connect us with you picked up close for the less fortunate, blah, blah, blah. Now a guy had a conversation with him and he said, oh, I wish I could win the lottery. I went and bought him three lottery tickets, just dropped him off. He called me back. He said, oh my God, that was so great. I said, hey, you know what? I hope you win, man. Uh, all I'm where, asking wherever, is if you um, win. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I was joking. Wherever Brian Buffini is, he just got cold chills. I don't know <laughs> if you've ever followed his stuff, but he, uh-huh. he basically has built a career out of teaching what you just talked about as a system. Like that's the only thing you should ever do. Right above you in my screen green is Steve. And Steve, I think you said the other day you were out knocking doors in a hundred degree Phoenix heat. So what advice would you have to offer Fed? Take lots of water. And when you start babbling at the door, they offer to room <laughs> for about 10 minutes. I quit door knocking after 110. Why? Uh-huh. Why? Because you get delirious. Kill you. It will kill you. <laughs> Ask Ronald. He'll tell you. Oh, Ronald. Ronald. What? Could you tell me how you door knocked? How do I door knock? Yeah. Walk up to the door with something of value to give them, either a newsletter. We have the Cromford Report here, which is a real estate report on the market. Very comprehensive. I have a little newsletter that I send out. So let me ask you a question. When you door knocked, you went up to the door and you stood right there at the door? Absolutely. Take Knock on the door, take two or three steps back. You don't want to be posing a threat when people come to the door. I've done it for years in several businesses. Yeah, I actually, I took a class on it and I thought it made just a lot of sense when you go up and you knock on the door. Now, I was always hunting for real estate and I do it to this day. I'll knock on the door and then if it's five steps down, I'll go down and I'll step back about 10 feet. So there's a 15 foot buffer and I just stand there. And what that does is that makes the client come out or the prospect come out of the house because they feel safe. If I'm too close, they're just going to hold the door and I got to speak through the door. And it's a much friendlier environment. And for me in real estate, I would just, I would just ask them, I'd say, look, a friend of mine told me, and I I don't even know if I had the right house that this house, it was a red brick house with blue shutters said that they were uh, interested in selling. I don't suppose that's, I got the right house, do I? And they would just immediately engage because they're outside and they feel safe. And then they'd start saying, well, yeah or no, no, it's not. Oh, well, golly, you know, I just love this neighborhood. Me and my family want to move here. You don't have to know anybody that's selling. Oh my God. And then, you know, oh, well, yeah, this couple here, they're getting a divorce, this guy over here. His, you know, he just died and, you know, it's like, and then you just kind of work that neighborhood and eventually you get that reputation. But my big takeaway was go back, you know, you almost can't go too far back uh, because it just makes them feel safe and they really open up. Usually it's about the second or third time around is when you become a familiar fixture in the uh, neighborhood and people will open up to you and really tell you what you're thinking. If you're going to make a pass through a neighborhood once, don't even waste your time. Yeah, yeah, I'm down on that. It's a process. You have to groom it. Probably my biggest real estate experience was back years ago, the first time I got in. I worked a farm area like mad for a year, did a newsletter, pulled a couple deals out of it got frustrated and left the business and went back into the electrical industry. And uh, about eight months later, I went into the office to visit the people I'd worked with. And the broker came up and hugged me and thanked me. They were getting two to three deals a month out of my farm area. And they were actually walking into the office. They weren't even calling. They were walking into the office looking for me. So it's like the silver mine in Georgetown, Colorado, the biggest silver mine in history. The guys that owned it, the three guys gave up and sold all the stuff, the shovels and picks and everything back to the 
store owner that sold it to him, he went in there with an engineer and they said, yeah, right here where they're digging. Five feet later, they hit a streak of silver that they're still mining today, 120 years later. Wow. Holy crap. Hey, Chad, you guys touched on something that I thought might be helpful for you guys. And I don't, and I've never mentioned this to you, but if you, can you give me, a, can I share this real quick on the screen? Okay. Can everybody see this spreadsheet? Yep. We've got you. You might okay. zoom in a little, Gary. You may want to zoom in a little. I zoom in. Bottom right, you'll see a plus minus bar. Oh, I okay. Yes. Are we there? Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. So what, I guess, I forget, it was, I guess Nate, Nate was he the one that was? I, anyway, one of you guys were talking, and this just kind of uh, spawned me a little bit. So you know, we're talking about CRM, and one of the things that I did when I owned my construction company, and I do today, is I set up a, a cash flow forecasting spreadsheet. And the reason of this is that, you know, when I first started business, I wanted to know, you know, if I took all of my operating expenses, right, and averaged that out, which out at the time was 18,000, and then I would do a percentage of my materials and what I would spend on my material you know, for, you know, the, you know, for all my projects, it would, it comes out to a number. So then I was able to, you know, basically say that, you know, my, my material cost based upon my volume was going to be 51%. And so these were like the numbers, you know, that of the yellow were weeks that I've actually closed out. And at this particular time, before I set up another spreadsheet, or saved it as something different, you know, I would just, that's way I would be able to tell like, okay, this is where I'm at. I'm right here on this week here. Uh, I haven't hit that week yet, but in cash flow, when you're looking at your cash flow, what Michael Gerber taught me was eight weeks of slated cash flow is happiness. 12 weeks of slated cash flow is peace of mind. And you can see, like I'm trying not to go too fast. We were generating about $161,000 a week in volume. And so when you subtracted out the payroll and my percentage cost, you know, you can see whether or not this number here is your bank balance moving forward. And so am I going in business or am I going out of business? And you can see that number just goes up. So, and this, you know, we're back to, and I'm gonna bridge this to CRM. Because I could see, you know, down the road, I needed to sell. I needed, you know, I got 12 weeks. I had 12 weeks in here. So I needed to get out there. And, and that was my butt kicker, you know, on my sales. And then, you know, I, you know, I'd have my total revenues here. So if you looked at this, you know, some weeks you hit it, some weeks you don't, you know, some weeks, you know, you know, it is what it is, but it's, it comes out to an average of whatever it is that you're doing. So that's how I was able to, you know, basically set up this with, you know, 161,000. That's what I performed on before. And so if I'd done it before, I should be able to do it again so that I would use that number. And then as you could see, you know, my numbers were, you know, continually going up. And so this would be all of my these were construction projects, but now, now I use it as a rental property. So the, you know, so then you come down here, I'd have my total revenues. And then my weekly payroll was about 46,000. So that would be subtracted. And then my overhead was running about 18,000 a week. And then I would do my projected cost of my materials. And then I would have a balance forward right here of what it was. And then that would carry over, bam, come all the way back up to here and then go back down, come back up, go back down. And so when you're looking at CRM, you know, I, if I had a prospect, sometimes, you know, whether the project was on hold or if I had something that was pretty much a lock, I would go ahead and put it in there just to remind me that it's out there. And I love this because it, it's just one sheet and I don't have to go to another form or another, 
you know, to get the full skinny. I don't know if anybody likes this or not, but I just thought I'd throw that out there, you know, so. Yeah, you... QuickBooks, I don't know why. It's one of the things that it's very common in finance and like rolling cash flow report, but QuickBooks took it out of QuickBooks Online. It's still on the desktop, but that's something that's really helpful to like, you can, you can use you know, QuickBooks to do that. But like with top producer as a CRM, like it would, as long as you were booking your deals, they would actually show you revenue. It didn't bring in expenses and everything that, that you've got in your sheet. But that's something else to consider is, you know, if you, if, and I'm not aware because I haven't been doing production, but they're, you know, something that would be great if, if, if a CRM would integrate with QuickBooks online through API. Um, oh yeah. I don't know. I don't well, know, yeah. David, does, does Sierra do that? Does it integrate with your QuickBook? No, I just use CTE, but I'm trying to, I'm thinking about going to Suzu. It integrates real well, Sierra. But they are, they're trying, I think their next big release is the transaction management. And then they're going to figure out how to really have a, you have your transaction numbers on there and you put your cost in there. So they're eliminating CTE a little bit at a time. But with the transaction management, you'll be able to track everything you're doing, I think. So probably like top producer, it'll attract revenue. But right now ECT, so I just plug in the numbers there. I also wanted Ronald. to say, you were, you were talking about, uh, this is Michael Gerber's, the E-Myth contractor. And uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's, it's It just says uh, Gary Nash, Nash Construction. He quoted me in his book. I thought it was kind of neat. Michael Gerber, yeah. he's an interesting guy. Was, unfortunately we lost him four or five yeah. years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ronald, you've been very patiently waiting, man. You get your hand up. How can we help you? Uh, thank you. I've, I've got a question for you. You, you uh, advised me to start this Phoenix Life Transitions a while back, and we, we started doing that. And um, I interviewed my first person last week, uh, a state planning attorney. Tomorrow, I'm going to be interviewing a grief specialist with Hanson's Mortuary. I'm really pleased to, to have her on, on uh, tomorrow. Now, the, the question that I've got is I'm really looking for people that I can refer to my estate planning attorneys. I want to keep those attorneys fed and they'll return referrals to me, right? That's, that's one of the big goals. Well, as I was talking with the grief specialist, she happened to say to me, you know, I, I talk to people all the time about their estate plans and, and uh, they tell me all the time, well, I don't have an estate plan. I need to get an estate plan. And she says, I don't know any attorneys to refer them to. And I said, well, send them to me. <laughs> I will talk to them and find out, you know, what, what the situation is. And I can, I can tell them which is the right attorney for them to, to see. And she's a little reluctant to do that, I guess, because it seems probably seems odd to her to send, you know, oh, you need an attorney? Well, go talk to my real estate agent. That, that probably seems a little weird. But that's you, just need, you need to train the hashtag, not just right. Say so just, but the tag we gave her was not just the realtor. Okay. And we don't want her introducing you as a real estate agent or even as a real estate professional. She she could say, well, listen, actually one of my professional contacts, Ronald, has a team of people that help families with all aspects of life transition. And he actually has already, typically when someone asks, him he can understand what their needs are and then choose the right attorney that best fits the family's needs so it's not i'll oh, call this guy he's a realtor it's that so it's like she can explain okay. what that relationship is and that what would be important is that she can you know can highlight the fact that you have gone out and built relationships with these attorneys you understand who they are you can connect them to the right one okay that's helpful i think that may that may help her to be relaxed and able to do that I want to give you, you have a list, right? You're buying leads or gathering your own. I ran a test last week on Facebook. I've never gotten this good of a result. I had pretty good success with Facebook. A video watch campaign. I had 17,000 people see the video, 15,000 watched it all the way through. And I spent a hundred bucks through the math. So if you're producing this content, like if you have a grief counselor and a state planning attorney, if you have that video, Turn that, take your, take your entire probate list, everyone, every lead you've ever gotten, put that into Facebook as a custom audience and just run that as a video watch campaign. You can, for pennies, for under a penny, a, a, a watch, a full watch, under a penny, I was able to get people to watch the video. So if you put a thousand probate leads in there and you can get the same CPR that I did, like that same cost per result, would it be worth a penny to have somebody watch that video that, that's oh, in that situation? Gosh. 
Yeah. So it's a way to, to a way to just put a little bit of a budget, a little bit of paid paid ads behind your content effort. It's going to work organically. You'll get people to find it. But to give it a bump, go ahead and run it as a as a video a video watch is the ad objective. There's a bunch of different ad objectives, but the, the, there's no call to action. You can you can put in you know your your uh, intro outro. You can put in your domain or phone number. But there's no clickable call to action. The whole point is just to get them to watch it, just paying for the brand impression. And at a penny, I'll pay for brand impressions all day long. So just a little something extra to get some momentum behind those because that's that's really valuable content. And you, you could, you know, just put, I mean, how many leads do you think you have in total? I, I not very many that have email addresses. That's the matter you're you're gonna you're gonna use facebook has 640 unique match points on 90 percent of americans so if we have their first name last name mailing address phone number like we're they're gonna match on multiple variables so you don't have to have their email address it helps it's just it's a it's a useful match point if you have it but they're gonna match on other things they've got demographic databases credit databases you know all kinds of stuff and we can't see that stuff but they have it cost on the back end so that's how we can get 90% match rates on a probate list, even if we don't have, you know, their email address or. Full okay. All right. Well, so I will... it's something you can do for probably $5 a day. You can get yeah. multiple brand impressions and get those videos, like get those videos watched. And you'll obviously upload the video natively to your Facebook page for, for Phoenix yeah. transitions. And then connect your community groups to your page. So as they watch the video, if they click on Phoenix Transitions, then they're on your Facebook page. Then they can click the Phoenix Transition Community Support Group. Then they're in your group. And that you're just working on and slowly building trust with the valuable content that you're already doing. Okay. That that sounds really valuable. I didn't realize I thought I had to have an email address in order to retarget folks like that. You, you do it as a custom audience. And map to the first name, last name, mailing address, phone number, and even if the fields are empty, it'll just skip it. So, um, how many? How large was the custom audience you uploaded in order to get fourteen thousand viewers, or whatever you said? That actually wasn't. A, that was a saved audience. That was in, in the real estate space, not not for probate. Okay. That was for this company. I was just playing like you can pick up in, in three months. It's completely different. So I have not been able to, you know, four to five, six cents is pretty typical on video watch. But the, the watch throughs was what was amazing to me that 15 of them watched the whole thing. That was interesting. And I only paid a penny for them to do it. But it like if you've got a thousand people in your probate audience, a $10 budget is going to go a hell of a long way. You'll probably get 12 to 30 brand impressions a day running a budget like that. And then each time you upload a video, just create a different, you can use the same campaign, the same ad set, but at the ad level, just when you upload a new video, make a new ad and run it to the same audience, the same campaign, the same ad set, a new ad. So this week it's the attorney next week it's the grief counselor next week it's you know the estate sale professional and they'll get used to seeing like for pennies on the dollar you'll be in, in front of them putting these professionals out there and you're not asking for anything it's, it's non-salesy at all this is it's a hybrid so it's still part of your inbound marketing campaign but you are putting a paid budget behind it just yeah. to give it more momentum okay so the way i'm uh, running this actually i'm running it on a platform called b and that allows me to to be live on both Facebook group and on YouTube. My, my YouTube, I started a YouTube channel for Phoenix Life Transitions, so I'm right. both of them at the same time. So that's where I'm at. I'm, so the, the other question I had: any other? Do you have any other ideas? You're you're so great at these ideas, Jet. Any other ideas for finding people who need estate uh, planning work? need to trust or will i mean i feel like anywhere you can find a person that's wealthy and has an ego they usually go hand in hand golf that, course that, I, I mean it just as you organically build relationships you can always reference your and i'm gonna tell you something last year and this, i realized how much exposure you know my estate i really you know, helping other families kind of woke me up for vocal and set up an estate plan have you ever done that like have you done that for your estate and it can just be a pretty casual, organic conversation. If they clam up and their body language is kind of reclusive, then just back off and move on to the next one. You don't have to take it. Yeah. They, I mean, quite honestly, like in your friends group, 
and, and any kind of Facebook groups you're in, any kind of networking events you go to, most people, I mean, pretty much anyone who's, who's got over, especially if you've got over 100 net worth, you should have, even if that's as simple as having your property titled, you know, like your real estate is kind of the entirety with rights of survivorship. It doesn't always have to be a full-blown you know, revoke a living trust title property so i'll add my sister to my bank account title my car as chad and or you know so it trans there's a pod a transfer on death people just need a simple estate but so if they're you know on the lower end of the wealth spectrum they still should talk to an attorney and get help and legal advice on how to properly title property to avoid probate if they're on that other end of the spectrum they probably do need an irrevocable living trust at least those people anyone that's over a million dollars in net worth really should have an asset protection trust, even if it's just a domestic asset protection trust. So, you know, to protect them from lawsuit and becoming a target of litigation. Anywhere that you can find affluent people, and I was joking, but not really, our ego tells us we're invincible, we'll never die, we don't need an estate plan, right? Not a lot of people think that way. And that's how they end up, you know, freaking out at the last minute, Medicaid to pay for them, but they can't because they don't want to sell all the family property and they're stuck and that's ego it won't happen to me so you, you anywhere you can find people who have been thinking that way and not calling them out on it but just saying hey what i did you know i, I was thinking about that this way but one day i woke up and what i did is i put a plan in place and now i help a lot of the families do that and have you done that and i find that to be effective it doesn't make them you're not criticizing them for not having it. You're saying, you know, listen, uh, it's the feel felt found, right? Like I felt like I didn't need it. Well, what I found was it was actually the smartest thing I could have done for my estate. So if you're at the beginning of the call, man, you need to, if you're not be sure, I'm out here and I'm on the whole river. I have a beer with you. I'm yeah, be you us, but it's too damn hot. So I came out here to the Pacific air condition. I got hungry watching the meat. That's too, man. I was like, oh, God damn it. I haven't eaten lunch yet. But uh, sounds like you've had a good week. Tell us about your win. Yeah, it kind of, the stars lines up this week, man. We got five new listings going active. If I get all the paperwork done by Thursday. So one more, one more transaction to do. So, yeah. So you've got all five coming active this week. How long, How like how far back do those contacts go? The first conversation on the longest one. Sure, it goes all the way back to January for the longest one. Okay. And then February after that, last year for another one, actually. So three of them are multiple properties. So the furthest one back, we ended up selling three homes. For the, and then the one that I'm going to right now, I'm actually going to the Soquami, so I'm in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. And that one went back to February. So we sold a condo in Edmonds and then close to a five-acre property out here. So right next to the Soquami. We're going to have... 950000 for that one, so that'll be a nice, nice one, yeah. That's great. All so what's your things. total, what's the what's the total gross across those five? Let's see, we got 959 for Soquami. I haven't added it up yet. 959 for 960 for Kirkland, 350 for Black Diamond, nine, 900, and 950 for uh, Furion. So basically $4.2 million. <laughs> Yeah, everyone is four uh, percent commission on our side. Uh, yeah, that's amazing, man. So you've got almost almost four and a half million dollars worth of listings coming through. Week. Yeah, yeah. One of them's about a probate. It's a referral from a probate. So she was the PR. We sold her mom's house back in March. Or sorry, April it closed. But her and her husband are moving to North Carolina to be with their son. And she called me up and said, "We want you to sell our." House. So. It's amazing. It's it, the indirect monetization, going that extra mile, offering that extra thing, like that comes back to you as million dollar listing. So anyone yeah. who doesn't like to do the the non dollar the, the things that you don't get paid on right now, pay attention. Because that's where those those future deals come back and, and you get surprised. I had I was going to tell you, Corey. I had my record week with seven listings. It was actually from Wednesday to Friday. I I posted seven probate listings. But it was following a two-month dry spell, and we were I, all the leads was just starting to gain momentum, and you know I was becoming like the the public figure in the space, and I'm like shit, I, like it's not working anymore. <laughs> and I had gone two months with nothing; I could not get a deal, and all of a sudden I had seven inbound listings over three days. I had my ass handed to me. 
but they my price is sure it sure wasn't four million dollars in inventory so good for you man i'm like i'm really glad to hear that yeah like other than just sticking with these folks and following up and i know you, you just made david Pennell's heart happy when he heard you say it's okay you stuck with him for eight months but other than that like that there's right. making sure that you stay in touch what would you attribute the success to i mean is it, just, is it consistency is it your marketing is it your approach what, what can others learn i from think you? yeah being consistent and picking up the phone like you know all those deals we picked up the phone multiple times and you know sometimes they're voicemail sometimes we got a hold of them but just being consistent and not being afraid to call like call calling for me like i've been working with david and you guys for the last year but calling i've been getting better and better at it and hands down calling is the the best way to get in and you know not a lot of people will call so but calling and then following up with a letter if i get if i get somebody on the phone and then i'm talking to them having a good conversation and i get the appointment sometimes i won't send a letter but if i don't get a hold of them then i'm definitely sending the letter so but calling got a call awesome right well, thanks for sharing <laughs> Keep that's up excellent that that's excellent yeah that's the plan but now he's coming for you he's going to take your seven figure trophy yeah i know that's fine i'm ready to step down <laughs> Ready to get me RV and step down. Yeah, come out here. We'll, we'll go steelhead fishing. It's like 20 feet that way. Nice. Corey, before we run, I'll be in Leavenworth. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to hang out here for like two weeks, but I'll be in Leavenworth in, in two weeks. So if you want to come over and uh, spend some time together, we should. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Gary Nash, you're up last. I see your hand up. Yeah, I was. Just, you guys were talking about the Facebook and, you know, I'm knee deep in marketing with Facebook and stuff. And They've got some real restrictions on the word investing right now. Or real estate. Or real estate. So, but YouTube right now is not. And I was going to recommend to you, know, you guys, one of the things that I've done is I've set up a YouTube channel with just my name because that gives me the flexibility to talk about anything. And I can then talk about Genius Investing Academy or I can talk to you about, you know, how to get on American Ninja Warrior. I, I like that flexibility. And by becoming that expert in your, your field, then of course you can, you know, set up those videos and, you know, just talk about, you know, you know, if you're in probate, you need this help, whatever. I mean, if anytime you can get any kind of public awareness from that, you, it's, you're going to get some traction off of that. And that also gives you credibility, you know, you, you know, so it's, it's good advice. I mean, YouTube, YouTube's an amazing Sunday. platform. It's YouTube is, can you hear me, Gary? Yes. YouTube is challenging with probate because we can't create that custom audience. Like we can't take just the probate list and, and target them. That's why I suggested Facebook for that particular campaign. What he's done on his organic, like his inbound strategy, he's uploading natively to YouTube and natively to the Facebook group to get the organic traffic. But it's hard to target probate from YouTube because they don't have where we can take a customer list, upload it, and then just run ads to them. That's where Facebook really shines is being able to do that. So if we knew, and then the thing is about the, the personal representatives come in many colors, right? It's hard to target them based on that fact because it's not a data point that anyone has. And demographically, they could be anyone. So it's without running just a general broadcast message like through in 25 miles of you and hitting everybody which can be very expensive. That's where Facebook can be a, a really good, like using their, their custom audiences, it can be very effective in putting some momentum behind your organic stuff. Sure, just I just want to be careful on, on the words that you're using because they're flagging. You know, that video I think I put together when I went out and measured your house, I put that together and talked about how I flipped that stair around to create more you know space in that kitchen. And because I said real estate investors, yeah, you know, that, that, oh my God, whack. They, they, yeah, their algorithms, basically everything I do with all the leads, I actually got us whitelisted. So we go under the algorithm underwriting, but it took quite a bit of time to do. And I'm working with them right now on that. And anything you put up with the word real estate in it is automatically flagged. And you can appeal and submit for a human review, but it takes time and it's frustrating. But I, I do have uh, another call to jump on in two minutes. Thanks for sharing the wins, all the good ideas, good conversations. Sorry about the bumpy internet in the beginning. I'll be sure to be on this network next week. But uh, I love these calls, guys. Thanks for all your contributions and uh, for all your help. And have a great week. See ya.